Welcome everyone to this work in progress talk presented by the Oregon Humanities Center. I'm Paul Pepys, the director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the, at the University of Oregon. Work in progress talks are short informal presentations given by faculty and graduate students who are current research fellows at the OHC. If you have questions for our presenter at the end of the talk, please use the chat feature of Zoom. You can access that feature by hovering over the bottom of the Zoom window with your cursor. The questions will be moderated by me and my co-hosts and I will ask them. The talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing later today on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. I'm delighted now to introduce our speaker, Mark Carpenter, a PhD candidate in history at the University of Oregon. Mark earned an MA in history from Penn State and his, PA in history, his BA in history from Portland State University. Mark's interests include US history, Native American history, and the history of memory. Mark's talk today, Memory and Erasure of Settler Violence in Early Oregon, 1848 to 1928, is based on his dissertation, which he's been working on as a 2019-2020 OHC dissertation fellow. Mark, uh, thanks for joining us and thanks for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Uh, let me quickly share my screen here. Uh, and see if I can get rid of all the little doodly Ds that uh, is being added by Zoom. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining me. I, again, have been privileged to have this grant from OHC, and so I have not used Zoom as much as many people I'm sure are on this call. So I hope you'll forgive uh, the, kind of, the, the offhand nature of this presentation uh, includes my use of technology. Uh, I do want to start uh, by acknowledging that uh, whenever we meet in the Americas, whether we're meeting virtually or otherwise, we are meeting on native land. Uh, so for those of you who are in Eugene, we're meet meeting on the land of Kalapuyan peoples, uh, from where I'm broadcasting from in Milwaukee, the land of Cowlitz and Clackamas peoples. Uh, I also want to say um, that uh, if you're interested in what I'm working on, uh, if you are sparked by anything I say today, uh, Part of what this OHC grant uh, bought me the time to do is to finish an article that will be published in the Oregon Historical Quarterly in June. Uh, it'll be available June 19th, uh, that, which delves into some of the topics I'm introducing here in much more depth. Uh, that's Pioneer Problems, Wanton Murder, Indian War Veterans, and Oregon's Violent History. Uh, if you are part of the UO community, I, the University of Oregon Library has a subscription, so do feel free to go take a look at that uh, come June 19th. Uh, the broadest possible uh, way to describe my work, I look at the uh, memory, commemoration, and erasure of uh, settler violence uh, in the early Oregon, which encompasses both Oregon and Washington, and how uh, Euro-Americans uh, tried to carve a heroic history out of the horrific violence of colonial conquest. Uh, they had kind of a universal problem that they wanted a heroic mythopoetic history uh, for the region and so they all had to deal with the reality that colonial conquest was inextricably and in some cases notoriously linked to theft violence rape murder and attempted genocide uh, but their approach to that problem how they tried to square those two uh, incommensurable things uh, varied quite a lot between organizations, uh, between decades, between audiences, and between authors. Uh, there were different tactics that were used in different times, and I've listed kind of the, the big four, which often overlapped, uh, whether you might choose to blame inequitous violence on a few fringe actors and thus try and redeem uh, the rest of the colonizers, whether you might instead celebrate violence as a necessary part of white supremacy of conquest or as a necessary reaction to perceptions of indigenous violence, or as was increasingly the case in the 20th century, whether to ignore or even erase inequitous violence from the historical narrative. Uh, and the great thing about disagreement, since different people had very different approaches to this and different ways of choosing uh, what to celebrate, uh, what to condemn, what to hide, uh, anytime you have disagreement that generates records, and that's very great for a historian trying to tell the story of the shaping and reshaping of memories of settler violence. Uh, so at the core of my primary source base for this, uh, there's a couple of very large kinds of primary sources I'm using. Uh, one are the records of historians of the Northwest uh, in this period, uh, local, regional, national, amateur, professional, successful, and very much not successful. Um, 
both what they wrote and what they chose not to write. Many historians would gather surveys, would gather interviews, would gather sources, and then uh, several of them, including uh, all the ones I've got pictured up there, would carefully curate away the kinds of violent stories that they didn't want to have be part of their histories, but nonetheless kept their records. So within their records, you can see the stories they didn't want to tell and importantly, uh, voices from those who inflicted violence and uh, those who, were, who suffered from that violence, who wrote to historians trying to tell their story, uh, but who were then uh, deleted from the official historical record of the period. Uh, another major source, again, related to that one, uh, are the journals, the reminiscences, and the writings of uh, pioneers, and I focus especially on those who played a part in violence against Native people, uh, so volunteer soldiers or just miscellaneous pioneers, and depending on which audience they were writing for, their own kind of inclinations, and uh, where they thought their story would go, uh, they would speak very differently about violence. Uh, stories written for private use, for yourself and your family, or for local use were often much more candid about uh, what you might have done uh, during the, the period of peak colonization than stories uh, written for the public, for the official record. Uh, and sometimes you can see both versions. So uh, uh, John Drake there, the guy with the clipped beard in the center of my frame, uh, had a quite candid journal about the, what he'd done during the uh, snake wars of the 1860s. Uh, but then he and his wife went through and edited uh, that to delete most of the theft and violence and uh, ideations of genocide from that while preparing it for publication in the 20th century. Uh, and then the third major source base that I work with uh, are the records of various organizations that tried to shape uh, academic and public history uh, in this period. So that's pioneer organizations, that's uh, historical societies, uh, the Oregon Historical Society and Washington Historical Society especially, and that's Indian War veterans groups, uh, particularly the Indian War veterans of the North Pacific Coast, who I'll be talking about uh, at some length today, uh, as that's the, they were the focus of that article I've got coming out. Uh, my plan today, again, we're trying to squeeze this into a tight 15 to 20 minutes, and it's a big old sprawling dissertation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a genesis of a particular violent story through an early generation of historians, and then uh, through the successful efforts of the Indian War veterans of the North Pacific Coast to bend history into something that was more flattering for them. Uh, I'll talk then briefly about the broad scope of the dissertation, uh, including the parts that are very much a work in progress, and so are still a little bit diffuse, and then there should still be plenty of time for questions. Uh, I want to open uh, with a description of what was probably the most famous uh, massacre perpetrated against indigenous people in the Northwest. Uh, it was nationally reported and known in the 19th century, the Little Butte Creek Massacre uh, in Southern Oregon near Jacksonville. Although it is the most notorious, I'm willing to bet there are a decent number of people here in this meeting who have not heard of it. Uh, hopefully we can change that going forward. Uh, as the genesis of this went, uh, Southern Oregon was awash in colonial violence in the 1850s. Uh, there was a man named James Lupton who came to the uh, Oregon Territory in 1850, uh, moved to the so Southern Oregon Jacksonville area in 1851. He called himself Major James Lupton, but there's no reason to think that he ever actually held that military rank. He worked briefly as a quartermaster's assistant. Uh, and from at least 1853, possibly before, he had ideated and contemplated a mass killing of Native people. Uh, he talked about it with friends in 1853. He would threatened to do it before being restrained out of fear that there would be a Native counterattack. Uh, but come 1855, he finally found his moment. Uh, there were increased episodes of violence, often wanton violence being inflicted by settlers. There were reprisals from local Native communities. Uh, Major James Lupton uh, seized his moment. He went and met with local Indigenous leaders and assured them everything was okay in Jacksonville, we're gonna have peace, it's fine. Then he went and raised a militia to quote, massacre the Indians while they were off their guard. Uh, having kind of set their minds at ease, he figured this would be the perfect time for a surprise attack. Uh, he got about three dozen guys uh, to come along with him to the nearest group of native people that they knew about uh, along Little Butte Creek, just past his property. Uh, probably Shasta or Tekelma people who were part of Jake's band. There's a little dispute about uh, the majority culture of that group. They snuck up just before dawn, uh, while well, it was still dark, fired into the sleeping camp, uh, then moved in with guns, swords, and knives to kill any survivors they could find. A number of members of Jake's band uh, were able to get away, to run, to hide. Uh, 
while they were doing that, uh, James Lepton and his men uh, seized a few of the Native women who'd survived the initial attack uh, and uh, threatened to kill them if their husbands and father brothers would not come out of hiding to be shot. And it was while that he was doing that, uh, one of the people in hiding shot James Lepton himself uh, through the lungs, and he expired, uh, one of two Euro-American casualties at the time. The number of Native casualties is somewhat disputed. It's between the, somewhere in the 20s and somewhere in the 80s. Uh, it's difficult to get an exact number. Uh, so this was an extraordinary episode of violence, but it was not entirely an unusual episode of violence. Uh, it became famous because of what it unleashed. Uh, the, there was a reprisal from local indigenous communities that attacked a number of Euro-American families. Uh, that kicked off the uh, final Rogue River War of 1855-56, which in turn uh, influenced a number of the other wars declared in uh, Washington and a bit in Oregon in 1855-56. There was a period of quite a few linked wars. Uh, it was also famous because it was witnessed by Euro-Americans who were not involved in the uh, slaughter themselves. Uh, the day after uh, Lepton had led his attack, outraged survivors led uh, Euro-American troops uh, from the nearby Table Rock Reservation to see what had happened. Uh, to demand justice, and they had every reason to report it up the chain to make sure that the rest of the nation knew who was to blame for the ensuing violence. So this was extraordinary in the body count. This is an unusual number of people were killed, but there were other mass killings of Native people across the Northwest, in Nisqually, in Port Orford, and other areas of Oregon and Washington. It was unusual mostly in that it was reported. Uh, there were many smaller acts of violence throughout this era, and many Euro-Americans who embraced uh, unabashedly the pursuit of uh, extermination of genocide. Uh, so I've got the most famous quote related to that up here uh, from uh, one of the rare people who uh, publicly protested against it, uh, who spoke to one of the volunteers in the Rogue River region, region uh, just following the Lepton massacre, who said, uh, we found several sick and famished Indians who begged hard for mercy and for food. It hurt my feelings, but the understanding was that all were to be killed. So we did the work. And this was not an isolated uh, instance. There were others who also had the understanding that all were to be killed. I'm not going to say the full quote from James Kutuga because it involves a slur, uh, but you saw a recursion uh, from later reports, uh, again, from people who are willing to break some of the earlier silences, that, that you heard the phrase knit spread lice uh, everywhere across the Northwest in this period, uh, referring, of course, that it's uh, a justification for killing children because it's breed lice. Uh, it's a long-standing uh, Anglo saying for justifying mass murder and genocide. Uh, there were objections to this, uh, some moral, but many of them were practical. Uh, there was worries on the federal side of being uh, bogged down in a long and unwinnable war that would cost Euro-American lives and Euro-American monies, uh, much like the one that had just been concluded in Florida. Uh, so there's this quote here from General John Wool, who was probably the loudest of the federal officials decrying this mass murder. The determination of the Oregonians to exterminate the Indians may prolong the war almost indefinitely. And again, this was a national debate, so this brought a lot of attention to what was going on uh, in the Oregon and Washington territories. Uh, many of these officials, uh, again, very publicly objected to cost to uh, the infeasibility rather than the action. So George Ambrose, who was the Indian agent for the Rogue River region, wrote, we really need to stop this extermination stuff. It's not gonna work. It's going to be costly for our community. But of course, George Ambrose would not care how soon the Indians were all dead and believed the country would be greatly benefited by it. And again, I don't know his heart, but this was the public discourse of the time. Of course, I'm in favor of mass extermination. It's just whether it's practical or not. And uh, in fact, in many places, it was seen by people who were fighting in these wars, particularly by some of the volunteers, but others, as kind of a general war against Indians rather than wars against specific polities or against kind of specific indigenous nations. So I've got a quote here from Lauren Williams, who I'll be talking more about later, uh, during the Snake War, saying, there are no friendly Indians in the jurisdiction of this command. Uh, no matter what their protestation is of friendliness, no matter what their distinctions, there were definitely federal figures who made distinctions between between different native groups, particularly uh, when they're trying to make peace and make treaties. But for many of the volunteer soldiers on the ground, it was a war against Indians generally. And it was an ugly one, and that was well known. And so, of course, that is a problem for the Euro-Americans 10, 20 years later, who are trying to figure out how to depict a heroic story of Oregon. 
Uh, some of it is very straightforward for them, but this is kind of a special problem that they had to deal with. Uh, so one of the first attempts at a big history of Oregon, uh, William Lang's history of the Willamette Valley, uh, kind of set the tone by splitting settlers between rogues and honest men by saying, ah, there were some bad, there were some bad folks, a few bad apples down in Southern Oregon, uh, and they had committed wanton murder that was the root cause of Indian Wars. Uh, unlike the good settlers, like me, Herbert O. Lang, and the people I like, uh, who of course were horrified by all of that and uh, dismayed by everything they saw. And again, they might well have been, of course, uh, but this was nonetheless a way of them disassociating themselves from the colonial violence uh, that they had benefited from. Uh, and he was uh, unusually frank in his assessments of what had gone on uh, in Southern Oregon, and he used slightly less uh, fiery but still present language uh, when he talked about a few of the other conflicts that indignities put upon the uh, native providers of the soil were uncondemned by the better portion of the community. So his rogues included both the high class and low class people. And he wrote uh, one of the most apt uh, assessments of what caused the wars in Southern Oregon that would appear from a Euro-American press in decades. Uh, native people fought, he wrote, to expel white intruders from the home of their ancestors, superinduced by special acts of ill treatment by the invaders. And that is uh, true. Uh, that got blocked out by later generations. Uh, Herbert Lang is a white supremacist dude, but this particular assessment was actually somewhat accurate. And it was not a popular assessment. Uh, this was not a popular book. It spurred outcry, it spurred protests, it bankrupted his publisher. Uh, this did not go well for Herbert Lang. But this approach, uh, when taken in a more moderate and modest way, was one embraced by other early historians in the 1880s. Uh, A.G. Walling's History of Southern Oregon, most famously uh, Hubert Howe Bancroft and Francis Fuller Victor's History of Oregon, uh, similarly condemned a violent fringe while exalting settlers generally. Uh, they were a little bit more canny about it and said, oh, the violent fringe is very small and we're not going to name them. Um, but they still embraced this model. Oh, there's a few violent volunteers. Everything bad that happened is to blame on them. And this worked for many of the people they were writing for. This was popular for much of their audience. Uh, however, it definitely did not work for the people who had committed those acts of violence, the people who had been directly involved in those volunteer causes and who were now being painted as incompetent villains. Uh, and so they pushed back against this narrative because they wanted special praise for their part in fighting in the wars of Oregon and Washington. They wanted a special pioneer praise. They wanted to be the truest heroes uh, over and above other pioneers, certainly over and above the regular troops and military, uh, US military that they'd clashed with. Uh, so one of the organs to fight against this narrative was the Indian War Veterans of the North Pacific Coast, uh, founded in 1885 and kind of straggled into non-existence with the very last member in 1938, uh, but active in from 1885 to the 1920s. Uh, and they have as their official goal, they want to transmit a true history of the Indian Wars and impress themselves and their posterity with patriotism and all of that good stuff uh, to boil it down to something a little bit less Flower, fanciful and flowery, uh, they wanted pensions and they wanted posterity. They wanted to be uh, recognized as the heroes of the Northwest in both, both in history and in monetary terms. And I, I do focus on that history, not just because I'm a historian, they had that themselves. The very first order of business when they first convened, they had a parade, they had a barbecue, and then they denounced Herbert Lang by name for being wantonly malicious towards them and towards the settlers of Oregon. Uh, and as they argued against, they argued both that they had played a vital part, they, that they had to commit all this violence because they were fighting, quote, the dreaded red men whom they framed as demons from another world. And those are some of the nicer quotes. Uh, and they attacked all historians who dared to speak a word against them, who accused them of being wanton murderers, who accused them of committing mutilations. Uh, who accused them of being anything other than paragons of glorious military virtue. And I'll say it's, it's, it's pretty easy to find that as duplicitous because if you go through their organizational records, as I have, uh, in private, when they're not writing for historians, they absolutely celebrate those self-same acts. So they resent any historian who dares to bring up that say they mutilated the body of Walla Walla P leader Pio Pio Muxmux, and then they swap stories about how they mutilated it and who got what part uh, when they're meeting in private. Uh, after those, those public declarations. Uh, when you're trying to shift the historical narrative, one of the best ways, of course, is to write a new book. Uh, so they funded uh, through subscriptions the writing of a new history of the Pacific Northwest written by one of their own, uh, the amateur historian and very canny politician, Elwood Evans, uh, who wrote that Indian wars are a necessary evil, 
but it's okay. The, you know, the untold good will emanate from them uh, because, as he put it, uh, America can only be ruled by Americans of the purest American stock. Uh, but it's okay because uh, Indians, Indians themselves started all hostile operations, which is, of course, utter BS. Um, and what was was contradicted by bountiful parts of the historical record, but uh, Elwood Evans never left the historical record get in the way of the story that he wanted to tell. Uh, this was the sort of history the Indian War veterans wanted. It was not as popular as they'd hoped. Uh, works by Bancroft remained kind of the official story. Lang was still out there. There'd been a whole lot of books in that print run. Uh, and so they, they had more success changing the historical record using the organs of government. Uh, in 1890, uh, again, these are very influential guys. Many of them are politicians themselves. Uh, they got the Oregon legislature to fund its own history of the Indian Wars in Oregon. Uh, and that history, which came out a few years later, was written again by Francis Fuller Victor, the same author as the History of Oregon, Volume 2, uh, but had now changed the narrative about what had happened in Southern Oregon. The Lupton Massacre was nearly erased. It was a regrettable incident with no real details. Uh, the, the volunteers were exalted at every turn. They were the heroes in this new history, uh, in large part because she was leaning on their reminiscences much more heavily rather than the other sources that had told uh, more untoward stories. Uh, and then uh, in 1891, uh, the Oregon legislature also gave the Indian War veteran of the North Pacific Coast the ability to unilaterally certify Indian War veterans to say this person did fight in the Indian Wars. All you need to prove that you've done that was to have a certification from this veterans group. And that became especially important when they moved from getting uh, state government to endorse their narrative history to getting federal government to endorse their narrative history. Uh, in 1902, uh, the federal government, uh, again, the federal legislature passed a law giving pensions, extending pensions to new kinds of Indian War veterans, including the Indian War veterans of Oregon and Washington. And particularly, uh, you can see in this language, extending pensions to people who fought in Oregon and Washington Territory Indian Wars from 1851 to 1856 inclusive. And that meant that all, anything that could be pitched as a war during that time would now count as a war under federal eyes which had not been the case back in the 1850s. The Little Butte Creek Massacre was decried by federal forces in the 1850s because it was going to start a war. But now it was no longer distinguished from formal war in federal law. You could now get a pension for actions in that. And in fact, uh, again, several of those years, there's not an official war under federal lights in the 1850s. They now all count. And in combination with the laws they passed in Oregon, if the IWBMTC signs off, any Indian killer of that era, of the 1850s, could now get a federal pension. They did successfully uh, reframe history around what they were looking for. Uh, of course, they didn't do that alone. Uh, there was a broader push uh, towards changing history over time. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that in just a bit, but I wanna talk about the first, the kind of three categories of intervention I'm hoping to make with my dissertation. And again, I, I wanna stress this is a work in progress, uh, not a work in completion. Uh, and so these, these might be just a touch ragged. Uh, one of the things that I'm hoping to get at uh, is, as I look through the source material is to look at the Northwest Indian Wars, uh, in the, particularly in the 1850s, as expansions of ongoing colonial violence rather than just clear junctures where violence starts and stops. These wars were uh, crescendos of a drumbeat of continuous colonial violence through the period. And part of how I argue that is because so many of my sources come from people on the ground who were engaged in violence against Native people, and that, that happened whether or not there was a war on. Uh, they were able to have much more opportunity for action, just like James Lupton was. When, once there were the intimations of war, certainly once a war started, they were able to get in uniform, they were able to get paid. But uh, and I've got a quote from Samuel Stewart here. Uh, we were fighting Indians before the army, just the same as we did in the army. Uh, a man did not have to belong to the army in those days to fight Indians. And you see variations of that in a lot of the records. Uh, and I'll pause here to say, to the extent that I can make this work, I only make this work because there's a voluminous and wonderful scholarship uh, on this period, especially, and on colonial violence generally in Oregon and Washington in this period. Uh, I rely on work by Gray Whaley, Mark Feskov, uh, David Lewis, Katie Barber, many, many, many others. Uh, and without that work already existing, I wouldn't be able to touch some of the stuff I'm trying to talk about. Uh, but I do think my use of sources uh, from people committing the violence on the ground, some of which have been underused, some of which I haven't really seen in the scholarship, lets me bring new stories to an existing narrative. So sometimes that's uh, bringing new perspective on military or quasi-military actions. Uh, there was a, three successive invasions of Tatutney land from what's now Port Orford in 1851 
They're sometimes grouped under the Rogue River War, but having the perspective of people who are on the ground fighting uh, in those invasions uh, does change the narrative around them a little bit. Uh, also bringing in acts of everyday violence during this period uh, that were connected to an overall heightened feeling of the understanding was that all were to be killed, or at least all that were not perceived as being your American controlled were to be killed. Uh, whether that's a lynching at uh, Wolf Creek, uh, at the site of what's now the Wolf Creek Tavern State Park, whether that's uh, shootings in the great broader Puget Sound region long before there's anything like a war with multiple settlers writing about how they shot at Indians uh, because they felt threatened when they saw them. Uh, whether that's uh, after the period of wars lynchings in the greater Bellingham area, uh, found uh, evidence of multiple lynchings uh, around the very northern part of Washington. This is a photo negative of one of the people who was involved in those lynching parties pointing to one of the trees from which they hung a, a lummy man uh, who was found vaguely near a, cr a crime scene. Uh, this also lets me look at uh, threats of extermination of genocide or attempts at genocide that didn't work or that were ideated but not acted on. So I've got people who went out to go murder a native person and then they were gone. I've got Lauren L. Williams, for example, again, during the Snake War of 18, 1860s, who ordered his men to kill every Indian they could find. Uh, but as it turned out, the Northern Paiute knew Eastern Oregon a lot better than he and his men did. And so they couldn't commit mass murder as they'd been ordered to because they couldn't find somebody to commit mass murder on. But the intent was absolutely there and he put it in writing as a military order and kept it in his journal uh, for later. Uh, and I, I do really wanna stress that there was for many people, for Lupton, uh, for Lauren L. Williams, uh, for Stanley Stewart, for others that I've read, uh, there was a general push to kill native people whether or not there was a war on. Indian killer and Indian fighter are terms that you'll see as terms of art in this period. And part of that was a willingness and sometimes an eagerness to kill native people, uh, whether or not there was a war. And I've got a quote here from Lauren, uh, Lauren Williams. Uh, Last year, I met no Indians who were at open war with the whites, yet I had the satisfaction of killing a couple. Um, and part of how and why they could do this is that they could rely on the broader Euro-American society to support them uh, over justice for native people in many circumstances. This did, there were exceptions to this and it certainly uh, faded to some extent over time, uh, though um, white supremacy is of course alive and well in our society today. Uh, but in that time, especially when you see the records of people who objected to the killings, many of them would say either, oh, I really wish that this guy hadn't gone and tried to kill some native people because now I'm worried that, that there's going to be a counterattack and I might get hurt. So again, kind of like you saw with George Ambrose, this notion of, of course I'm in favor, but it's a bad idea tactically, or even those who are sympathetic will nonetheless defend uh, white mass murderers over native justice. You have people going, ah, I really wish this guy hadn't done that, but man, if the Indians show up, I'm gonna have to shoot at them because you have to defend it. Uh, people who frame themselves as sympathetic would nonetheless side with mass murderers over native justice in many, many, many places. So that's one major intervention. Uh, there are two other areas I'm hoping to dip my oar in a little bit. One of them, and I think this is probably actually going to be uh, where the gravity of the piece is, is on uh, history making itself, on how uh, this very torrid, nasty narrative of the height of colonial violence, which again did continue into the era of history making, uh, was shaped and reshaped and sometimes deliberately muffled by those working in history. Again, whether it's pioneer associations or historians. I've got, uh, I think, a particularly key quote there uh, from Clarence Bagley, who was the premier historian of the Northwest in the early 20th century. Uh, While what I say will be the truth, I shall not give all the truth. I shall rake up no old stories of evil. And he's, uh, that's in a letter to another prominent historian. And there was generally a pioneer code where you don't talk about the stories of inequitous violence. Now, what counts varied, right? So a lot of the historians, especially the local historians uh, writing in the late 19th century, uh, had a pretty narrow scope for what counts as inequitous violence. They wouldn't wanna talk about violence against women, for example, but they would happily talk at length about the time they shot a native guy for looking at them funny. Um, but there was a general feeling that, there, that you should not rake up any old stories of evil and that those needed to be uh, covered up. Uh, and I think, Proving cover-ups, or if you want to be decorous, the careful exclusion of short sources can shape how we discuss historical controversies. Uh, there are controversies over things like the, the Maxon Massacre in Northwest Washington, where the main voice kind of denying or minimizing the, con the, con the massacre was Elwood Evans, who in many, many places, again, 
he would he would take whatever approach or not approach to the evidence he needed to to make volunteers heroes. And that can shape how we look at that uh, that kind of disagreements over what happened. And that can especially shape places where indigenous history and local history actually agree on what occurred uh, re related to violence. And it's only professionals who provably tried to silence stories of violence who kind of threw mud in the water and tried to ch change that narrative. I, I think sometimes we get caught up, uh, we quite rightly have started privileging indigenous historical memory of some of these events, uh, but sometimes uh, Euro-American historical memory actually agrees with it. So we can move beyond a kind of he said, she said, pick your side and show, no, he, he said and she said, and then this, this guy who wanted a heroic history came in and tried to change the story. And that I think is a useful intervention we can make in, in several spheres. Uh, and then the last chunk of the dissertation uh, reckons with various ways in which this bundle of historical half-truths of partial erasers of this kind of mishmash of history going into the 20th century, uh, as there was more of a push towards uh, downplaying, erasing, or at the very least generalizing violence into something heroic. Many different groups, uh, as, as the old pioneers died and their children were taking over these memory organizations, uh, played a role in using those historical narratives or trying to shape them to their own end. So again, we'll see what happens with COVID, but I, I'm hoping to speak at the Center for the Study of Women in Society. I got a grant from them to talk about uh, how women's part in colonialism and in violent colonialism was used in various ways uh, to recruit allies for women's rights. Uh, one of my surprising early findings was the Indian War veterans of the North Pacific Coast were very early supporters of women's suffrage, in part because uh, celebrating women's righteous defensive violence was a way of, of uh, sanctifying violence of, as a whole of that era. Uh, I, there's also looking at kind of uh, monuments with very, that celebrated generalized violence, but then uh, lost some of that violence uh, even as early as the 20s, where the, the, the message of those uh, faded away. Uh, I think most relevant for us, of course, uh, I, I, part of my project is looking at our pioneer monument in the center of the UO campus, uh, which was meant to represent an Indian fighter, uh, an Indian killer, uh, again, of that type, like, like a Samuel Stewart, like a uh, Lauren Williams. In this case, he was named Big Frank. Uh, but that uh, violent artist inspiration was first generalized and ver very widely perceived at the time, but then kind of faded out over time despite being there. So looking at these old monuments with new eyes, knowing uh, what the norms and clashing norms of history were in the aughts and in the tens and in the twenties of the 20th century. Uh, I also have an odd section uh, looking at this shift in how people talk about native culture and particularly native language. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, it was one of the things that you did if you moved to Oregon in 1840s, 1850s, if you wanted to be able to trade, if you wanted to be able to communicate, uh, you learned Chinook jargon, a simplified version of the indigenous trade language Chinook Wawa of the region. Uh, but it was seen as something low by many of the cultural bro brokers of the 19th century. William Tolmy, uh, who wrote a lot of uh, reminiscences and kind of tried to shape early history, described it as a vile compound of language. Uh, and the Indian War veterans of the North Pacific Coast originally wanted their slogan to be in Chinook, uh, Iklush Tilikum, uh, which is translated as uh, one good Indian, uh, referring to the phrase, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, so particularly gross use of indigenous language. Uh, but they chose not to because they saw Chinook as low in the 19th century. By the early 20th century, uh, that had shifted and uh, Chinook jargon became a marker of pioneer status. Uh, you would have pioneer meetings uh, where you, you would have uh, menus in Chinook with no translation. You'd have whole sections of them that would be entirely in Chinook so that only the old timers would understand. Uh, the historian Edward Meany described it as a magical elixir, elixir that could open up old historical memories for the people he was interviewing to create his histories. It, and it, it pops up everywhere to the point where if it's in Chinook, it might make the front page of a paper. And this is this, and I'm using as kind of a keystone to a broader turn towards nostalgia in the early 20th century that's been widely identified. It has its corrosive elements, right? It often involves putting native people in the past, but I've also seen some instances of native activists kind of using this to recruit unlikely allies. Way back when, when I was first becoming a historian, uh, one of the first things I found was a weird situation where a native activist was able to win an ally out of somebody who thought he was a friend to the Indians from a long line of friends to the Indians whose grandfather was actually a, a murderous rapist. Uh, but because of this weird shift over this time, particularly the shift towards nostalgia and the silencing of violence, uh, he had a perceived false history that was able to create real benefits for native activists to recruit him as an ally. Uh, 
And uh, in, in terms of Chinook language, if you made your complaint in, in reservation conditions and you put it in Chinook and you referenced how in the good old days this would never have happened, you could get a lot more play. You could make your complaint about reservation conditions hit the front page of the paper. Uh, and I also see within that a push uh, in the early 20th century for native uh, scholars, for native people to try and reinsert and correct the Euro-American historical record. Uh, and often they would be kind of uh, siloed off as, oh, here's the native story. How interesting, but it wouldn't necessarily become part of the overall record, but it was there. Uh, and so that can be kind of brought up again as a constant fight to make sure indigenous stories do in fact shape the history of the Northwest, which of course is a battle that we're still fighting today. Uh, I do wanna speak just a bit before questions uh, to beyond academe, right? Of course, I want to succeed in academe, but I think there is a utility to this project uh, beyond the halls of academe. Some of what I'm covering is new, some of it is pretty well known, but I think uh, demonstrating a cover-up is very helpful in uh, convincing skeptics that there was a crime. That if you show these things happened, people said that they did them, and then other people deliberately hushed that up, that is a useful way for explaining people who kind of don't really wanna believe that this is part of history for why they haven't heard of these stories. They didn't hear of these stories because people worked to make sure they wouldn't hear of these stories. And I think there is, there is use and utility in that. Uh, thank you, I know that's kind of a very quick run through of what I do, but I, I look forward to taking questions. Thank you so much, Mark, for that very interesting uh, accounting of your research. We've already had a few questions coming in, and I'll, I'll uh, go back and uh, ask the first one. This is from uh, Timothy Williams, historian in the Honors College at UVO. Uh, were these veteran pioneers uh, organizing and asking for pensions perhaps inspired by or responding to the broader post-Civil War veteran organizations and historical societies that were popping up east of the Rockies? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, they're, they're popping up in the midst of the West of the Rockies move towards historization. They're arguably an offshoot of the Oregon Pioneer Association. Uh, they share a lot of membership. They meet at the same time, though notably, uh, while the Oregon Pioneers organize themselves by year of arrival, uh, the veterans decided to march separately as veterans, so they thought that was the most important thing about them. But yes, they certainly uh, interacted with uh, the veteran societies of the East, mostly as a form of comparison. Uh, con almost every meeting they would complain, oh, these Civil War veterans, you know, who shot Americans are getting all these pensions. Why can't we, who shot, insert racist term, uh, get similar pensions? Uh, but they were absolutely keyed off that. Most of their arguments for pensions were based on existing growth, uh, the existing growth of federal infrastructure for pensions in the 1890s and 1900s. And to their dying breath, they all were offended that they didn't get the same level of pensions that Civil War veterans did. Um, next question. Can you speak to the trail of teal, tears marches that occurred here in the Pacific Northwest, particularly in Oregon? Can you say something about that part of the history? Yes. Yeah, so those those happened and they were horrific, um, 1856 and especially in 1857. Uh, and one of the, the smaller things that if, um, there, there's great scholars working on those and I am hoping to contribute a little. Uh, I do have a few records from people who were guards on those marches. Uh, so particularly their children. Uh, so I'm looking through Daughters of American Revolution records where they would speak about their parents' war experiences. Uh, there's one where she talked about her father who was a guard on that march and how the, um, there was a funereal wail taken up by mothers carrying their dead children uh, that never stopped, that he, he did, that drove him half mad because as soon as one person ran out of breath, another person would take up the call. Uh, so I'm hoping to, uh, speak a little to it, but I think part of what I'm bringing is just a few more voices from the people who were on the ground effectuating those trails of tears, not just the commanding officers reporting back to headquarters, giving a pretty spare estimation of what happened. Uh, is there any source material from indigenous oral history or other sorts of indigenous sources that you draw on? Or, or... Uh, so I, I, I recognize, uh, I, as I was finding this document, oh, I didn't talk enough about that. Uh, so yes, I absolutely draw on existing indigenous oral histories and on a rich and growing uh, set of indigenous histories, right? Indigenous people have written their own histories. Uh, I, I focused in part on Euro-American shaping of history, but within that, there are quite a few indigenous voices. And in fact, uh, one of the things that I found quite often Euro-American historians would write to native people saying, hey, I need to clear up what a name is. And they get a letter back saying, here's the name, but what you should talk about is this thing that happened to my sister. What you should talk about are my war experience, which was this. And so I, if, if, if I do nothing else, I, I have a moral imperative, I think, to bring native voices from the period who wanted historians to speak of something and were then silenced because it didn't fit the narrative they were constructing. 
So the next question is uh, to ask you to elaborate a little bit more about the connection uh, of your narrative to the the efforts for women's suffrage that you mentioned as the third part of your intervention. Yeah, so uh, that's going to be a longer talk, of course, uh, but there was one of the ways to get in the room to talk about women's suffrage was to talk about the heroic pioneer past. And particularly, there was an embrace of a woman named Mary Harris, uh, who had uh, defended her home during the counterattack from the Lepton uh, massacre. And that was uh, especially used by Abigail Scott Dunaway as one of her stump speeches. And that got her into the room to talk to the veterans and to kind of shape those stories. And so it's putting that uh, in concert with uh, stories of Sacagawea told by Eva Emery Dye and an increased embrace of Narcissa Whitman as a martyr figure. All of to say, there's various uh, stories that, that women's rights activists used as a way of kind of gaining allies, of gaining entrance into spaces and gaining vocal support. Uh, but even those stories you know, were different and disparate depending on which historical narrative was being pushed, right? It went from a story of women's heroic colonial violence, right? Mary Harris shooting at native people to more of a story of martyrdom uh, roughly in tandem with the push in the women's vote movement from kind of an earned rights movement under Abigail Scott Dunaway to more of a kind of higher moral plane movement by the time you get to the 1910s. Uh, uh, an interesting, somewhat related question. Was there any crossover with the uh, black exclusion laws and the treatment of African-Americans in general? Uh, yes, thematically. Um, less than I was expecting in the sources, but you do definitely, I mean, obviously those are, those are hand in glove part of the same push for an exclusionary white supremacist Oregon, right? Many of the people who are fighting native people did see this as this is part of creating a place where it is either just your Americans or your Americans with uh, people of, of color laboring inequitously under them. Uh, you do see it in a few places. Uh, one of the, the veterans who I, I cover uh, also teases his abolitionist relatives by talking about how there are no uh, black people in Oregon, and we're, we're making sure that stays. So it's definitely there, uh, but it's often more thematic or sotto voce than included in the records. Uh, I'll say related to that, there's also um, records of indigenous enslavement uh, that I think some, some of which is very well known, but some of it is brought to light. And more generally, uh, some of these soldiers who say, oh, no Indians here are comfortable with native people as laborers, especially if they can treat them in an equitous way. So one guy says, I was fine with Indian laborers once I got permission from their uh, the guy in charge of the reservation to beat them if they got insulin. So there's very much kind of a link of, of treatment of people of color in both exclusion and in uh, exploitation. So the next question is about, um, have you found any evidence of the involvement of Mormons in the violence that was happening in Oregon? Because there is evidence of, of that in uh, Missouri and Utah. Yeah, um, I have not. That doesn't mean that it's not there, uh, but I haven't found that explicitly um, evoked as such. But the next uh, the next question starts with a statement first. The story really began in 1843 when a few dozen people invented the Oregon Territory Provisional Government for the purpose of legalizing their land claims of 640 acres, which is about a square mile, which were later endorsed by the U.S. Congress. Could you say something about the implicit intent of Congress that settlers would kill natives? Right. So that's a very tricky uh, question. I'll say first, a uh, part of why I started in 1848 instead of 1843 is that while there was, of course, uh, a longstanding American push for settler colonialism, for removal, uh, it was it was difficult for would-be settlers to effectuate that until after uh, the the assumption of federal power over Oregon in 1848. So there's a, there is a reason why I do 1848 instead of 1843. Uh, I think there is a push pull uh, where uh, there is an implicit endorsement by passing a, a, an act that doesn't have any uh, codicils for uh, negotiating away land, right? And, just assuming it will all work out later, and also in rejecting treaties that were found too generously. Uh, I do think at its core, there's kind of a clash between uh, settlers who want murder, murder, murder right now, and a federal government that wants the absolute most land at the absolute least cost. They're both comfortable with the idea of extermination, but there are multiple times where the federal government doesn't want to try and carry it out because they think it's impractical and expensive. Uh, and again, they, they, they say that quite, I, it's not me projecting that, right? They say so. They say that quite clearly and repeatedly in their own documents. So the next question uh, is from Ruben Zoller. It's a, another colleague uh, at the U of O. Um, and perhaps you'll be able to answer this. This is, a, a, this is asking for a, a, a breadth of historical knowledge that uh, you may not possess. But is the de depiction of violence and the language of violence that you provide typical of what we see 
in war prior to this period, uh, when war is not controlled by a large military institution that seeks to follow international law, when fighting is done by small autonomous groups, is it typical to see lots of massacres and language about killing everybody on the other side? Uh, Ruben is thinking of warfare in Europe up through the 18th century or accounts of war in ancient Greek world. Was the type of violence you describe um, distinct to America in any way? If not distinct, is that significant to American history or how we understand that history? Uh, so, uh, yes, that does strain the limits, uh, but I'll do my best. I, I can't speak to ancient Greece, uh, but I will say absolutely this is common past the American experience. Uh, it's certainly common in settler colonial, right, the notion of colonialism where you're seizing land and removing the inhabitants and in other forms of warfare. Uh, the, the phrase that spread breed lice that was so common in the Northwest was not only common elsewhere in the Americas, but actually originated as a way of talking about the Scots uh, in the 1600s. Uh, so there's absolutely uh, functions like this elsewhere. Uh, I I'm, don't want to be an American exceptionalist in that way. Uh, I do think one of the changes that you see in uh, more modern eras, and there I'm not going to speculate too much past America because I'm an Americanist, uh, is this desire to cover it up more fully, right? That you're, there's, there's a lot more of a push to modulate, to get rid of a lot of the violence than you'll see in some earlier eras. Uh, if you want to go to ancient, right? The Neo-Assyrians were not subtle about what they'd done when they went and invaded and killed people. Uh, this, this desire for racial and, and denial and plausible deniability, I think, is uh, unusual to the modern era, though I'm sure, positive, it's not unique. Please don't hurt me, historians of earlier eras. I know there are other examples. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question is uh, from another colleague, uh, Nina Amstutz, who asks, could you speak to the University of Oregon's role, if any, in rewriting the history of colonial violence in Oregon? The university had been founded by the time of those revisionary histories that you speak about. Yeah, uh, so it's I, I can speak about it at least loosely, again, largely connected to my research on the pioneer. Um, the University of Oregon didn't write a lot about native experience. The, the people who were working here didn't write a lot about native experiences. Um, uh, history was taught along with other social studies topics. Uh, the gentleman who did write that, um, whose name is escaping me right now, uh, but did teach a class on America that taught about how good it was to expel indigenous people, and particularly that he taught that the strength of Oregon was that Oregonians did not um, marry or otherwise have children with the local indigenous people who he framed as the worst kind of indigenous people in the world. So this was absolutely taught at the University of Oregon, uh, kind of the older fashioned um, uh, uh, rhetoric of, of violence and exclusion. Uh, and I know that changed, but that changed after the scope of my dissertation. And if I research things after the scope of my dissertation, my dissertation advisor will yell at me. Uh, but yes, it was absolutely there. And again, the, um, the, the pioneer statue, which was put here in the center, uh, was put in to celebrate not only uh, the, the taking of Oregon, but specifically the kind of early violent taking of Oregon in the pioneer. And that's reflected in the speeches and understandings of that statue in the day, as opposed to say uh, the pioneer mother by the same sculptor uh, that was, uh, was put up a, a few decades later where violence is still there, but it's much more implicit and it's not uh, as openly bandied about as it was back in the 1910s. So, uh, let me just, I'm gonna skip a couple of questions. I'll go back to them, but the, this question relates to what you just were saying about the pioneer statue. This questioner asks, why does the UO allow the pioneer statue to stand and not take it down? Um, well, uh, <laughs> I would say, so last year they did, uh, there's, there was a, a committee on problematic racist things on campus. I don't remember its real name. Um, and that committee did find, uh, uh, among their findings, called out specifically the pioneer statue as an issue uh, that, that the U of O should address. Uh, we shall see. Uh, I, as to what it will take, I, I mean, administrations often move slowly. When I talk about that, I have you know much longer talk I can give about that. Uh, I do think that that uh, it would be good for the University of Oregon to lead uh, towards uh, reckoning with these history, pioneer history and monuments the way that the South is finally reckoning with uh, the racist history of Confederate monuments. So my hope is that we'll we'll start that soon. Uh, so going back, did you find any incidences of white settler violence during the Salillo Falls gatherings? Also, did you find data about Mexican mule train operators' perspectives on the violence against Native peoples? I have not found either of those things yet. Um, I would be surprised to see a whole lot about Salilo Falls because very early that was built up as kind of the happy memory of Native times by pioneers. So they talk about uh, 
in the genre, you often have, here's, here's the good stuff where I interacted with Indians, here's a violent story, and then here's how I became rich and successful and awesome. And so that, that was often restricted for the good stuff story. So it wouldn't shock me, but I haven't seen it yet. And I have not yet seen uh, stories from, from uh, Mexican Packers. Do you know uh, if there were any efforts by the historical societies and associations at the time to influence teaching in K through 12 schools? Uh, there was there. I've seen traces of it, but not a lot um, that uh, I, I, the records are what they are. Right. Um, but I certainly have seen push to try and um, particularly from uh, Evans and George Himes, the head of the historical society, to make sure that schools aren't teaching the wrong thing. Uh, but it's unclear what they're talking about, because um, there's not a whole lot of informal in, uh, formal instruction in even Oregon history until the 20th century. You'll, you'll, you, your, your instruction on U.S. history is east of, east of the Cascades. Okay. Um, a, a questioner is responding, uh, rec recurring to an earlier part of your conversation with me. Um, these native sources that you alluded to, can you name a couple of them? Sure. Uh, there's an account from a woman named Christina Williams uh, writing to Eva Emery Dye, uh, who was asking her again about a technical issue. Um, and who responded back, said, yeah, here's your technical issue, but what you should write about is uh, volunteers came and they uh, assaulted my sister. And the language makes it clear what kind of assault that they mean. Uh, there's another instance in the Bellingham area of a long correspondence between PR Jeffcott and Ruth Seaholm, uh, who was, was a, uh, a Native woman, uh, kind of talking about her mother and aunt uh, and about how a U.S. Army official kind of uh, forced her into a forced marriage and how she escaped that marriage and kind of found her own way after that. Uh, and that one, that, that historian to his credit, uh, did write that up, but couldn't get it published. So, and you'll see things like that elsewhere. Uh, are there any public museum pieces that add to your narrative that are accessible to the public in the Pacific Northwest? That's a fantastic question. Um, so add to my narrative is tricky. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll happily put in a plug for the new Oregon exhibit at Oregon uh, Historical Society. They just, that, that used to, um, very much planned to some of the early 20th century trips that I talked about. They've just revamped that. If the world ever opens up again, it's worth taking a look at that. It's been better. Uh, the, I'll also say you can find signs of this in a number of places. So one of the places where I found uh, some of my uh, evidence for the last portion was in the art museum at, uh, at Washington State University in Pullman. There's a series of pioneer portraits and Indian portraits. And the pioneer portraits kind of fell out of the story because there's amazing portraits of native leaders. But part of how he selected those portraits was that many of them were notorious local Indian fighters. And so he's got a portrait of, say, a guy named John McLean, not the diehard one, uh, who killed a bunch of people. And that's why he's having his portrait taken. And there's a short interview with him on the back. So if he's and again, I, I poked in that monument not knowing what I'd find. And it turns out murder, murder, murder. If I would say most most museums you go to that cover the pioneer experience, if you dig far enough, I wouldn't be shocked if you find something. Uh, our next questioner says, I'd like to see a new frame for the category of these local genocidal wars. So I agree colonial war works here, but it's not as global as I think it might be. Have you seen annihilating difference by Hinton? And do you think we might have a category of wars related directly to these types of settler expansions, occupations, and or wars on indigenous peoples? I think that that's a great conversation to have. Uh, I certainly think that it's worthwhile to see uh, wars against indigenous peoples, again, as, as the earlier question implied, in the frame with other forms of violence uh, in pursuit of white supremacy or in pursuit of, you know, even more restrictive than that, in pursuit of annihilating difference. I know the book, but I haven't read it. It's on my list. <laughs> kind of write a dissertation. Um, and I think that's a great frame. I do think that it's, it, you, you, I think it's good to have multiple frames. Uh, and I, I want to make that, I think it's good to both uh, look at these wars individually and look at them as kind of a broader frame of looking at what happened in the Northwest and look at them nationally and look at them globally. I think all of those frames can bring different insights to the table. Uh, just a point of interest from one of our uh, viewers, those who advocated for the exclusion laws frequently mentioned that these laws were necessary to ensure that black and native alliances weren't created. Yes, very much so. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a question. Did the ghost dance phenomenon reach Oregon? Um, Restarted, I, that was started in Nevada. Uh, there's there's a version of it, but I don't have the facts on my fingertips to speak to it with enough authority on a recorded talk. Uh, the next question is from our colleague Kirby Brown. Uh, 
Really enjoyed the talk, Mark. I wonder if you might speak a bit about dealing with records and depictions of so much violence on Native lives, bodies, and lands, especially in the context of contemporary discussions about how such violence functions as popular spectacle for non-Indigenous audiences and historical intergenerational trauma for Indigenous peoples. Put differently, how to deal with this violence in ethical and responsible ways. Thank you, uh, Kirby. That's, that is definitely a struggle I have. Um, and I do, especially, uh, I, I find it difficult to balance the need to convince a broader uh, and often Euro-American audience of just how horrific the period was with, of course, responsibility not to sensationalize or to re-traumatize uh, Native people. And that's, that is a daily struggle to try and figure out what to include, what to exclude, how many details to put in. Um, I, I tend to, uh, perhaps wrongly, uh, default to including at least a few, to having at least a few stories which get to the gory details because I think that is necessary to kind of punch through the decades of erasure and uh, discounting that you have in the broader world. I, I again, I, I give public talks and I have people who really do not want to believe that there was such a depth of violence. They want it to be the, the pretty story that it replaced that. Uh, and so for my lights, I, I want to include at least a few of those, but I certainly don't want to write a torrid narrative that's just violence after violence after violence or anything that could remotely be titillating. Uh, so I try to include enough details of a few cases to make my point without uh, fetishizing or sensationalizing. I, I hope I get the balance right. So I'm, I'm just going to skip ahead to one that's related to that point you were just making. You want to speculate a little bit about the result in today's life of suppressing this information and this history in public consciousness for so long? Sure. Uh, well, I think uh, it, it allows a broader, comfortable narrative, uh, again, uh, that covertly supports a kind of white supremacist notion of the Northwest started by brave white folks, and that that is still held. Uh, even as we've chipped away at the edges of that. So I'd say, again, pioneer societies today, which still exist, or veteran societies will say, oh, Native people are wonderful, you know, and pioneers are also wonderful, right? They, they, we ha if you don't have uh, the root of how bad things were, it's harder to get at how much we might need to change. Uh, and one of the things I talk about in public talks is uh, we have changed what we, the general, you know, consensus majority culture of America has changed what they think is okay radically many, many, many times, right? To the better in many ways. Uh, it is worth examining some of the broadly held beliefs right now and considering whether they are as horrid, they will be as horrid in 50 years or 100 years or 150 years as how we look at what was a very common thing to believe in the 1850s. And I think that kind of framing, again, can punch through some of this, this buildup of colonialist rhetoric and erasure that makes people feel comfortable with the way things are. Uh, another comment, uh, uh, very interesting, well-researched. would be delighted to see this example of historical erasure find its way into the K through 12 curriculum today, perhaps to help satisfy SB 13 requirements and involve a collaboration with indigenous scholars. Yes, I think especially as we, now that we have this requirement to teach about genocide and Holocaust, I think having part of that curriculum be what happened right here uh, would be an, an amazing and important thing. And uh, yes, if I'm not involved, I hope it happens. <laughs> uh, this next question is from our colleague, Marcel Brousseau. Um, have you been able to see any shifts if the use of historic uh, historiographic imagery in the primary sources as the stories are revised and details are euphemized and erased? That is to say, do images of indigenous peoples, of violent acts and of white settlers shift in their style do they proliferate more or less as the history shifts? Does photography with its different relation to the construction of truth become an important intervention in this revision process? That is a fantastic question. Um, so I'll say uh, it's more, I'll say first, I'm not an art historian, so I'm, I'm doing my best. Uh, it's more of uh, an addition than a change. So very early, there's, uh, there's certainly a, a proliferation of images uh, de of dehumanizing, violent, monstrous looking native people uh, that's there in the time of the 1850s, right? Uh, going back long before anybody got to Oregon, right? There's a culture of this in America already built and that continues for quite some time. Uh, there's a, a tradition in America of kind of noble savage imagery uh, that definitely 
does not appear in things that say the volunteers put out, does appear in some of the other ones. Uh, in the early 20th century, there is definitely more of a push to have it be uh, all good settlers and then mostly good Indians with a few bad apples. Uh, and you'll see some shifts there. Uh, as far as photography, uh, there certainly is, um, that, that, that obviously provides images that are, are different, uh, that are somewhat photorealistic. But of course, as is known in other scholarship, uh, when it's photography of native people, it is often um, manipulated, uh, just as other art is. So they'll, they'll remove traces of modernity. They'll look for particular poses. Uh, I, sorry to get back to Proctor, but you know, Proctor, when he was sculpting native people, uh, would make them take all their clothes off. Uh, even when there's one instance where he bargains for a war shirt uh, that a black feet man has and then buys it from him because he wants this native artifact and then has the guy strip off the rest of his clothes to model because native people have to be, you know, barely dressed or just in some some approximation of regalia. You might add a headdress, right? So it's it's definitely different in photography, but it the there's still plenty of manipulation and kind of recurrence on a few tropes in the early 20th century. Uh, so, Mark, we're at one uh, one oh two. So, and we've got uh, uh, w one more, a uh, couple of more substantial questions. But uh, uh, one is I'm going to combine two because they're speaking to each other. Uh, this is one again from Kirby Brown. Um, he's also interested to hear about the relationships between historical erasure and public commemoration. Kirby's thinking here of Kevin Broyneal's argument that the problem isn't so much the erasure of Indians and settler violence from the public imaginary as it is the excess of certain kinds of commemoration that celebrate, sanitize, rationalize, etc. What are your thoughts on these relationships? And and uh, Tim Wilson, T Timothy Wilson, Williams says, um, it, it, related to Kirby's point, the literature on lynching as spectacle could be really helpful in that regard. Yeah, uh, so I think that's definitely present. And I think in a way, this actually relates back to that question of sens sensationalism, right? Um, that there is, uh, as there's struggles over what to commemorate, there was an alterity that was considered and pushed for by the veterans, by some of their, their, um, their allies to depict much more violent scenes. Uh, so they wanted, for example, uh, a kind of a, a mural or a plaque or something that would, de that would depict uh, a volunteer heroically shooting down a native person uh, as part of, of the creation of the historical site in Chimpui. What they ended up with was a little plaque on a picnic pavilion. Uh, and so there is definitely an active effort to create the more sanitized images. Uh, and I, I see that in Bruniel that it's not that there's not that, you know, it's, it's where the memory is, right? That there's going to be a public memory that's sanitized, but there's still definitely a private memory uh, that that revels in this violence and kind of where to find find uh, a third way, since we're talking Bruniel, right, where you both note the violence without celebrating or erasing. Uh, there's it's it's harder to find those those areas, uh, the third spaces for those. <laughs> All right, Mark, um, we're, we're really at the end of our time now. I want to thank you so much for this fascinating talk and the fascinating conversation. It's been a real pleasure. I want to thank all of you for joining us for Mark Carpenter's Work in Progress talk. Um, I want to invite you to join us again a week from today at noon Pacific time for our final Work in Progress talk of the academic year. Our speaker next week will be Nikolai Marar, UO Assistant Professor of Philosophy and Environmental Studies. Professor Morar will speak about his current research on microbial biology and environmental ethics. For more information about the Oregon Humanities Center and our public events, or if you'd like to contribute to supporting our research and public programs, go to ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks again, Mark. Thanks for everybody. We'll see you next time. All right.